not, please do, Phil. Well, it will be great to have you there. Oh, is there? Yeah. Let me get some from my bag and just <laughs> tape some on so you're not disappointed. So we can give it a start. Yeah, great. Thank you. Should we start? Let's start. Oh, is there still... Shouldn't have had. All right, let's make a start. I've always been incredibly passionate about evidence. I remember when I was 15 years old, I decided to become a research scientist. Um, this was quite a lofty ambition for someone that went to the type of school that I went to. It was a school that was from quite a disadvantaged background. I was incredibly fortunate to have an excellent teacher, Mr Slater, who really was pivotal to me achieving and becoming a scientist. He really valued mastery and he'd push us towards mastery. He'd say to me, Tanya, you want the test to be hard so that you can demonstrate your understanding. So I did go on to become a scientist, working not too far from here at the Peter McCallum Cancer Institute. I then moved on to work and became a teacher. I did this after two really transformational days. I was in my lab, I was working at the time at Queensland Institute of Medical Research. I was working with um, two Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students. And they were in my lab and they were doing project work. And when I looked back on my postdoc of those two years, they were my favourite two days. And I thought, if I just go back to university and get a Bachelor of Education, I can do that all the time. So I did do that and become a teacher. I then moved into educational research, working with Professor Brian Cordwell, looking at the impact of arts programs on students' learning outcomes. I then moved on to work at AITSL and then PAI, and then more recently at Learning First, working with Ben Jensen's team. I was incredibly fortunate to go to Toronto and look at leadership development there and interview people about that in policy, in practice, right down to students as well. And now I've joined the wonderful team at Evidence for Learning and I'm in charge there, the Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Toolkit. So real pleasure to be with you here today and talk about evidence. So how is it that Evidence for Learning really helps to break that gap that we know that exists between students' outcomes from disadvantaged backgrounds? I've been incredibly fortunate with my work with Bell Shakespeare and the Song Room to travel right across Australia. I've flown into Alice Springs and driven another six hours out there and I've always talked to the educators and asked them, what are the challenges that you're facing? They would let me know what they were facing, challenges such as low reading levels of comprehension. I could th see this for myself. So I sat down with these students who are in grade year 10 and I was administering the Social Emotional Wellbeing Survey by ACER. That's pitched at a really grade five, six level. I sat with these students and they were really struggling with the language. So I could see for myself the challenges there. So I think that's where evidence can come in and make a real difference. You can bridge that gap. 
So that's why everything that we provide at Evidence for Learning is free and unrestricted and always will be. So we're incubated inside of Social Ventures Australia and Social Ventures Australia is focused in on four key areas. Education, employment, housing and First Australians through those four areas. And we do that, we help those areas through funding, investment and advice. We're incredibly fortunate to be partnered with the Education Endowment Foundation as headed up by Sir Kevin Collins. I was there in London in March. They've now grown to the point where one in every three schools is involved in a trial to determine how something works, specifically within that context, what are the key active ingredients to make that work. We're also very fortunate to be provided with $6 million worth of foundational support from the Commonwealth Bank and also supported by the Berg Family Foundation to do this work. So we have an eminent advisory and governance board, including Professor John Hattie, also Professor Steve Dinham, um, Jen, Jenny Donovan as well, I've seen in the audience upstairs. So in representatives across different universities and also across the different government, uh, Catholic and independent sectors across Australia to help us and guide us in this work. So I thought we'd start with a quiz because it's a Monday and who doesn't love a quiz on a Monday? So the current state of evidence base in the world suggests that drinking six to eight glasses of water per day improves student learning outcomes. Can I have a hands up for true? Hands up for false. Yes, it's a false, okay? Because neurotransmitters don't talk to each other through water, they talk to each other um, via neurotransmitters. One neuron speaking to one neuron, neurotransmitter in the, mortar, in the middle, not water, okay? So the exact amount of hydration. And actually what studies have found is that the more the students drink water, the increased toilet breaks they take, so less time they actually have in class, okay? <laughs> but there is moderation to be had. Um, individuals learn better when they learn in their individual learning styles. So auditory, kinesthetic, hands up for true, hands up for false. It's a false on that one. We're not, we can't see consistently that learning styles are consistent throughout the life of the student. Also, if we teach you a particular learning style, what we can have is some student pushback and they'll say to us, Miss, I don't learn that way, I'm a visual learner, why are you trying to teach me in this way? So important not to limit our students. There's, there's not enough evidence to strongly support that statement. Um, it's great to use a range of different repertoire of skills as a teacher to engage your classroom and we're definitely for that. Um, I've written a whole article for ACR Teacher Magazine if you want further information about it. It's all that, yeah, it's limiting the students as well and the way we provide feedback to the students. So feedback on how students complete a task is more effective than general praise, hands up for true. Hands up for false. True. So some lovely work we found from Carol Dweck. Um, it was published just last year as well. It has added to this evidence base. And she was looking at different populations. And what she really found was that students from a low SES background benefited even more when they were provided feedback that was in line with a growth mindset. So they grew in their educational attainment more than other students. So the population in Chile. Um, to show the importance of emphasising a growth mindset, not just for all students, but especially for those from a disadvantaged background. And the greatest impact on, on students' outcomes is teacher quality, the greatest in-class factor. Hands up for true? Hands up for false? No, definitely true. The work of Hattie and others tells us that that has a magnificent increase and 
as teachers, you're in an incredibly fortunate position to influence that. So the last question of our quiz is, grouping students by ability improves outcome for all students. Hands up for true, hands up for false. So it's a false. We know that it does have benefits for that top 25%, but they can be extended in other ways, such as in if you're doing collaborative group learning, they can be put in charge of that group, while it does really hold back that middle and lower 25%. So we'll be talking a lot today about meta-analysis and looking at averages that's underpinned by lots of different complicated research. So this is a nice graph that shows us there is a complex story to be had under each one of those numbers. And I really want you to think about the variance underpinning each one of those meta-analysis scores that we come to. So if we look here, we've got a good news story for this Monday is that it looks that wine is mostly in the category of studies that have shown that it's protective against cancer in comparison to a bad news story for butter and beef. If we look on the left-hand side of the graph. So always bearing in mind the rich complexity that sits underneath each one of those scores. So this is our evidence ecosystem and what we're saying here is in order for there to be a thriving ecosystem, it's really built on three key principles. The first being that teachers and leaders in schools are crucial to all inf evidence informed practice at the school level. In fact, nothing can happen without them. The second is that by teachers and leaders evaluating their impact of their approach within their classroom or their school, they are the ones that should be driving the research that occurs. And that's really what this whole event is about and what Tom was saying at the start this morning, which is this is teachers leading the research. And the third point is that both of these cycles, so the impact evaluation cycle that occurs at the school level and our wider evidence chain are mutually dependent upon one another for growth. And we won't have a thriving evidence ecosystem in Australia unless we have growth within both and that they are talking to each other. And that's what you see going from the top across. We're saying that educators investigating the impact should be the ones driving the research that occurs in that wider evidence chain by researchers and then that informs the policy as well. And then that's fed back to the education, to the, the people in education in meaningful and understandable ways so it can actually inform their practice and start the cycle again. I'll just give you a minute to read this quote from Professor Jonathan Charples from the EEF. So I'm acutely aware of this very first point. I worked in a school, I was a biology coordinator at the senior secondary level, there was you know, 120 students that I was responsible for. Some days I didn't have time for lunch, we were just speaking before, some days you don't have time for lunch, let alone to engage with research. So I think we need to acknowledge and call out what are the barriers to us engaging with research as a profession. First is we have a shortage of time. The second is that there's a real overload of information to process. It comes in a large book, that's all right, but it's not easy to engage with with the timelines that we have. The third point is that there's an overload of information to process and a lack of sufficient contextual information, such as what's the cost to implement this approach? What's the month's worth of learning progress that I can expect if I implement this with high fidelity? These types of information are essential in decision making in the classroom. So this is our wider evidence chain and this is where we're saying with research in order to be helpful for the profession, we really need, the very first step is production. Okay, we produce a piece of research. But how can we make that more useful and more accessible to the profession? 
We need to synthesise that with every other piece of information that's available. We see this in the work of Hattie Mazzano earlier and Hellinger <coughs> and Heck. That second step is synthesis. Then we really need it to be transformed, additional information to be added such, of, such as months worth of learning progress. What's the cost to implement and what are the key active ingredients that I need to know to make sure that this will work in my setting for my students. And then we need engagement, and that's what we've got here today. Because we can have all the evidence in the world sitting on websites, in books, but unless us as a profession stand up and take that evidence and transform it into action in our classrooms, it is really useless. So then we have the next point where the educator is taking that research and they're implementing it within their context, with their school, in their setting, for their students mindful of specifically who they're teaching and the challenges that they're facing. And then that feeds into the wider evidence chain. So this is a quote from Professor Mark Rickardson from Monash University. So now we're back on the left-hand side in our impact evaluation cycle. So here it is. In that first stage, the school leader and the or the teacher is interrogating their data in the impetus stage, and they're asking themselves a difficult question, what is the key challenge that I'm facing in my school, in my classroom currently? What is it specifically that I want my students to learn. What are they struggling with at the moment and how can I improve their learning outcomes? Specifically, identifying that area. And then they're moving to the awareness and the analysis phase where they're looking for evidence that has been transformed, that has been synthesised with other sources. Maybe they're looking at the teaching and learning toolkit which we're gonna have a look at. They're then taking that and then they're making the difficult decision. What do I need to adopt with high fidelity to ensure that my students will have the maximum impact of this approach in my setting. And then they're also asking the question, what do I need to adapt to ensure that it works within my context, mindful of the research that's gone before them? And then they're cycling through a mini implementation cycle where they're planning, acting, evaluating continuously. And that is the wonderful job of the profession, to make micro adjustments, on the fly within the job based on the evidence. And then they're making the difficult decision at the end of one to two years of implementing a particular approach. Do I want to embed this or do I omit this? Have I seen improvement in the specific area that I was looking for, yes or no? And making that difficult decision at that point. So here what we've done and we've just recently published with ACER is alignment between different implementation frameworks and our own, the impact evaluation cycle and deliverology and looking at key differences and similarities across that. And what we've done, we've identified key questions that you can ask yourselves as educators at different stages of the impact evaluation cycle to structure your implementation. And at the bottom, what is an example is of implementing feedback within your setting. So, and the web link to the article is there as well. We've just published two weeks ago a literature review on implementation in education, looking at randomised control studies, and what do they actually tell us are key crucial elements that we need to get right in implementation in order to successfully have a positive influence on students' outcomes. So this is a table that summarises some of our key findings. So we're looking at dosage, fidelity, quality of implementation, and acceptability. Some key things that we found, which I've also found in other research studies, is yes, we need for the profession, we need for the principal to be leading this work in order for there to be successful implementation. 
we need some kind of ongoing structure, some kind of coaching model to underpin the implementation in order for that to have an impact on students' learning outcomes. And we can see that as reflected in improvements in the student learning outcomes, also improvements in students' attitudes towards learning. So how is it that we work at Evidence for Learning? The heart of everything that we do is really to encourage the use of evidence within the classroom. And we do this through building, sharing, and encouraging use of evidence. We build through our Learning Impact Fund. John Bush will be speaking about that later on today. This is where we pair a promising approach with an independent evaluator. So we've got a panel of different evaluators and we currently have three randomised controls running. We share through our teaching and learning toolkit, which is an evidence base that's globally updated every six months of 34 different approaches. And then we encourage use through our evidence-informed educator network, our evidence ecosystem and our impact evaluation cycle, which I've just walked you through. So two key outputs of our learning impact fund. The first is that we'll bring a promising approach, potentially to a large scale, so up to about We've got varying amounts of schools involved, so in some trials it's 12 schools and other trials it's 24 schools, of a promising approach that may have an impact on students' outcomes. We don't know because we're currently doing the trials. What we want to produce at the end of this is a two-page report that produces information on what's the month's worth of learning impact, what's the cost to implement, and what are the key active ingredients. In order to do this, we're using randomised control methodology, and that's what John will be speaking about in further detail today. We're using this so that we can determine exactly what is that month's worth of learning impact, but also we're always using qualitative methodologies as well. I always did mixed methodology because we can have the numbers, but we actually have to talk to the profession, and we need to ask them the questions, as I always did. Why do you think this has actually worked for your children in your setting? And you ask the principals, you ask the teachers, and you ask the students. And that way you have the how as well as the why. So the toolkit is international evidence base, an in introduction to educational research. It contains information on these three points, which is the month's worth of learning impact, the cost to implement, and the security of the evidence. Although we've got dollar signs up there, we're not selling programs, that's just an indication of how much it actually costs. So this is the toolkit on one page. This is underpinned by over 10,000 research studies. What I'll get you to do is pull out any device you have with you and click along with me. So if you go to evidenceforlearning.com.au, any device works, it works just as well on a mobile. If you go to that website there, and if you click on the toolkit, and that will take you to this page here. And you can look at the toolkit in different ways. So we've cut it up into different, according to organisational um, policies, according to sector, <coughs> according to stage of education. But let's go into the full toolkit today. So all approaches full toolkit. And what you get here is this dashboard. So this dashboard allows you to sort according to alphabetical order, according to average costs, months worth of learning progress, and also of evidence security. I know that when we showed John Hattie this, he said to us, well, there's only one way I would ever sort, and that's according to months worth of learning impact. 
And I must say I do with, agree with him quite a bit on that point, but also important and incredibly important to schools is cost and the evidence security. Because we want to know how firm we can actually say, well, this is the size of impact we can expect if we implement that with high fidelity. So now pick an approach that's of interest to you with your school in your setting or your system in your setting. Feedback is a big interest of mine. So what we have on this first page, we just have a summary of what is it, how effective is it, how secure is the evidence, what are the costs and what should I consider. That what should I consider bit really contains the most practical advice in, in regards to implementation around that particular approach. Now if you click on the references section, that will take you to a list of all the studies that have gone to make up that score that you see there. So we're looking at a mean weighted effect size. And I think we're all familiar with effect sizes here, but I can't help but share the equation. <laughs> so for example, if we have students that are in Minilit, which is a current trial that we're running, the mean of those students minus the mean of students that aren't in Minilit, divided by the pooled standard deviation, the pooled standard deviation just being the variance in those two groups. So what we've got here is a mean weighted effect size. It's weighted according to standard error, which is a measurement of basically the amount of students in each study. So the more students you have in a study, the smaller your weighted error, mean, um, standard error, the more you'll be weighted within this. So what we've done, we've taken the 0.63 mean weighted effect size and we've translated that into eight months worth of learning progress because we think that that's a more accessible figure for educators to deal with and more in the real world terms. So what we have here is a breakdown of all the abstracts that were involved in getting to that complexity of that 0.62. And each one of those has variants within them, like that first graph that I showed at the start. So what we've done now, and we published this late last year in collaboration with the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, it was actually the Centre for Program Evaluation as headed up by Janet Clinton, and she'll be speaking here today at this conference as well. So they looked at all the research for the past eight years in Australia and New Zealand under those 34 different approaches. And what we found was that there were some areas that there was really a lack of information. So for example, in feedback, there was a real lack of studies in Australia. There were some in New Zealand, but not many in Australia. In others, what we found was some really rich contextual information that educators can see themselves, well that really worked for my, will work similarly for my students in my setting because I can see, so for example there's an arts evaluation in there and we can see a 0.77 effect size in southwestern Sydney. This is well above the effect, average effect size that we see within the toolkit. But for those particular students, that's the impact that it had for them. So it's giving us more nuanced information. It also contains more qualitative study, so it's asking the opinions of educators and that's represented as well now. So there's 34 pages in, underpinned by eight years of summary of the research in Australia and New Zealand. So what we've done, we've worked with organisations across Australia in mapping the toolkit to their policy framework. So we've worked with the Victorian Department of Education, for example, mapping it to FISO, the New South Wales Department of Education mapping their school excellence framework to the toolkit so that educators are entering the toolkit through the policy environment that, that's most useful to them and also through ACER's National School Improvement Tool. And I'll walk you through an example of that now. So this is the toolkit as mapped to the framework for improving student outcomes, which is the framework here in Victoria that they use to drive school improvement. 
So if a principal is looking and a school is looking to improve in a specific area, they can now go and have a look and say, well, specifically, we know that we need to focus in on, it came back that we didn't have a lot of um, growth in the area of evidence-based teaching strategies. So here are some actual practical things that we can do in order to move that forward. So I'll just let you read this. This is from a principal in Victoria. Now what we'll do, we'll take a look at some of the materials that we worked up with AITSL around feedback. So take more of a deep dive into turning evidence into action, specifically in the area of feedback. So that's just the headline news for feedback. Before we start, I'd like you to pair and share with the educator next to you um, for two minutes, and I'll set a timer, on what you think feedback is, how you would define that currently, if you think that there are different levels of feedback that, can, that you can provide to students within the classroom. So time starts now. No.
two minutes is up. I heard a lot of rich conversation though and all on task, which is excellent. So to me, key and fundamental, I think, to any providing of feedback in any setting at the classroom level and also at the school level is trust. So I'll just give you a minute to read this quote from Dylan Willem. And here's a definition from, for feedback from the toolkit. I'm mindful too that we'd like to have probably some questions at the end of this, so we might speed up a little. Just give you a quick demonstration of this. So if I was providing feedback to my photo, on a photosynthesis essay to my students, how would I encapsulate this? So I would say to the student, I can see that you've improved in your ability in writing an essay because you have a clear structure, you have an introduction, you have a body and a conclusion. The student used to be struggling with that, so I'm emphasising that, that they've grown in that area. And then what I'd say to the student is a point where they need to grow in, which is, but what are you really need to focus your attention on now is to ensure that your paragraphs are linking so that they have logical sentences flowing from one to the next. And another bit of feedback I'd provide them with is in relation to the learning goals of this particular task, which is I can see that you fully understand the concepts underpinning photosynthesis. So that's the way I would provide feedback, hitting on all those different levels. <coughs> this is drawing from the Spotlight series with Aitzel that we produced. So really focusing in on the fact that if we praise students for being intelligent, we're encouraging a fixed mindset and that will inhibit them in later work. These are the different models that we've drawn from. We're drawing from Hattie and Timberley and Black and Willem, but keeping these models separate because we know that they're employed differently throughout Australia. So this is a table that summarises some of the key research, showing us where really it can be very effective to pinpoint feedback to, and it's really at that self-regulation level and at that process level can have an impact on students' learning, not only in that subject, but in others as well. I'm gonna skip that and go to questions. Um, this is, if you wanna find out more about our work, join our Evidence-Informed Educator Network and subscribe to our newsletter for updates. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook um, and any comments and feedback directly to me, please. And we've got one minute for questions. Any questions? Yep, great. Yeah, the special auditions were broken. Yes. Yes. Mm. Yes. Yes. Sure. Yep, definitely. So within the toolkit, we've got that group together with self-regulation as well. So when I'm presenting that material, I'm really focused in on things like cognitive organisers. So um, like a hierarchical concept map is an excellent way for students to learn incredibly complicated subject and the connections between those. And if we teach that consistently within assessment and throughout, then we'll see real gains in that area. So, yep. Um, it's interesting. Um, I know from work I do, and 
Yes. Yes. Have we got a have you got criteria that are concerning? We're going to say very still out of it. There might be some evidence, but it's not enough. You know, the tipping point. Yeah. Do you have some criteria for that? Definitely, and that's a great question, Phil. And so we denote that by our locked pads. So the amount of locked pads indicates the security of the evidence. So if there's one locked pad, for example, that like there is around school uniform that doesn't seem to have a large effect currently, well, we can't put our hand on our heart and say, look, we have, a, we definitely don't have enough evidence to say that as yet. So there needs yeah. to be more so the research. Is, it's not that there's, um, that there's not enough evidence yet. Yes, okay. exactly. Oh, fantastic, thank you. And I mean, that's the kind of thing where you want people to go out and actually do more and do. Definitely, yeah. and that's why we've commissioned those. So we've got three randomised control trials, Quick Smart Maths, Learning Maths, and Mini Lit running at the moment, and Resilient Families as well. So we're, ran, we're running trials on those currently to determine and feed back into the toolkit. Uh -huh. And in the future, we see the toolkit as being informed by practitioners. That's what we want to see. Pleasure. Pleasure.